We're in for a bumpy ride this week as Earth dodges multiple solar storm launches, but at least one of them's going to give us a glancing blow. That story and more in the news this week. If you want to learn how weather from our star causes impacts at the Earth that shape the future of our world, join professors Dr. Jenny Meehan, Michael Cook, and myself as we guide you through a space weather certificate program like no other. To enroll in the space weather and environment science program offered at Millersville University, go to Millersville dot edu slash swen. It's weather for the 21st century. This forecast also sponsored in part by CW Ops. Space weather this week is a bit of a mixed bag. As we take a look at our Earth-facing disk, look at all the little puffs all over the place. These are little mini solar storms, mainly filament launches, and this is what happens when we get close to solar maximum. They're just launching all the time. But the ones to watch is really from region 3354, right about late on the 27th, you can see whoosh! There goes a filament eruption. This structure looks like it's gonna go pretty much east of Earth. You can see it in the coronagraphs, but there is an Earth-directed component, so we could get an, an impact, a glancing blow right around the first. We'll talk more about that in a minute. But believe it or not, that's not the only thing. As you continue watching this region, even on late on the 28th into the 29th, you see another slight kind of whoosh-like eruption. And then on the 29th, near the end of that, once again, whoosh, there is another eruption. Now, both of these latter two eruptions look like they're going to go mainly northward of Earth, but there could be an Earth directed component in one of them, so we could be getting some glancing blows a little bit to the east of us and also to the north of us. On top of that, we're also getting a coronal hole that's rotating into the Earth strike zone. This could enhance the effects of this, uh, the solar storms that are glancing blows, so it's definitely going to be a bumpy ride for us as we move into the holiday weekend. And then on the top of that, as we take a look at the east limb, you see a lot of regions that look like they're going to be rotating into Earth view, but by the brightenings there, you also see that big eruption in the north. That's a far side eruption. So it tells you that we definitely have a lot of activity on Earth's far side. So definitely going to have to have that uh, solar flux remain high and those uh, risks for radio blackouts with big flares still on the menu. Switching to our M-flare and radio blackout threat meter, as we take a look at the X-ray flux over the course of this week, you can see we've been hovering above the seafloor and we've been popping quite a few solar flares. This does mean we have a lot of noise on the radio bands on Earth's day side this week and that trend is going to continue. We've been popping mainly uh, up to about R1 level radio blackouts and this is for mainly from region 3354, which is an X-flare player, so we could conceivably see R2 to R3 level radio blackouts, although the the risk is small. The largest flare we got was an uh, M3.85. Eh, it's almost an R2 level, not quite, but these are pretty short-lived flares, so they're not lasting all that long, which is good news. But meanwhile, this is going to continue easily over the next few days, and we could get even more activity as some of the regions that are going to be rotating into Earth view over the next few days look like they could be, be big flare players as well. Switching to our solar storm conditions, over the past week we've been hovering pretty much around unsettled conditions, although around the 24th and 25th we did bump up to storm levels due to a pocket of fast solar wind that was a bit more intense than we thought. It did bring us a little bit of a roar for a short bit, but all too quickly it was over, and then we continued around unsettled conditions, and now we're beginning to see these mini solar storms giving us these glancing blows. In fact, we bumped up to active conditions late on the 29th and into the 30th, and we should be seeing more of that as this new solar storm or set of solar storms give us this glancing blow over the first, possibly into the second, and into the third is when we'll start beginning to calm back down. Now returning to that solar storm that was launched back on the 27th, this is our solar storm prediction model, Enlil. Now this is NOAA's version of the model. The top panel's density, the bottom panel's velocity, and you're looking at down at the sun from the North Pole with Earth being off to the right. Now, as we take a look at that solar storm launch, you can see it's being launched mainly to the east of Earth, but 
there is a little bit of a finger that extends upward and is going to give us kind of a, that glancing blow right around uh, noon on the 1st is what NOAA's prediction model says. But NASA's prediction model actually shows that we could have an impact that's a little bit more than a glancing blow, but in and around the same time period. So expect any time starting around midday on the 1st, expect have some kind of impact. This means Aurora photographers, if you're at high latitudes, you definitely could get a show. Aurora photographers, at mid-latitudes, well, it might be a bit more sporadic. However, we do have a fast solar wind stream that is uh, coming up right on the heels of that particular storm, and we have those other two glancing blows that are coming right behind that. So it's really going to be kind of a sporadic catch-as-catch-can when it comes to aurora. So only if you're dedicated should you go out and chase. So what else does our sun have in store for us this week? Well, this is Stereo A. It's our partially far-sighted viewer. You can see here's Earth Here's the sun, and here's Stereo A staring at the sun just a tiny bit from the side. And when we take a look at the view in Stereo A, well, you can see region 3354. That's the most prominent region. It's also the most active. You can see it firing off some solar flares and even some solar storms lifting off from it as it makes its way to the west limb. But what I want you to focus on is the east limb in Stereo's view. Look at all that bright limb activity there. These are actually old regions that have survived their far side passage. In fact, when we take a look at the JSOC HMI helioseismology far side viewer, you can see those dark regions. These are regions from back on the 16th that were rotating to the sun's far side, regions 3329 and 3327. And these regions look like they've definitely grown and they are big flare players and solar storm producers. So this means we could have more chances for aurora and big solar storms being fired at Earth and also big flares. So amateur radio operators understand that flare risk is going to continue to stay pretty high. Switching to our moon, we are now passing through the full moon phase, with the full moon being on the 3rd. And by the 6th, the moon will still be about 87% illuminated. So you night sky watchers, if you want to catch those dim objects in the sky, like, I don't know, maybe some aurora, well, you're going to have this bright companion. So you're going to need to check your local rise and set times. Switching to our solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we are anticipating the hit from that glancing solar storm blow right around July 1st. At high latitudes, NOAA is expecting uh, minor storm conditions with up to about a 30% chance for a major storm. And then after that, we are expecting that fast solar wind stream. It's not going to be all that fast, but it could give us a little bit of extended storming. So that will then cause things to calm down slowly over the second and then into the third before things really begin to get reasonably calm, but we do have those other solar storms that look like they're going to go mainly north of Earth, but that could once again extend the storming a little bit. So aurora photographers, if you're at high latitudes, you could get a decent show in around the first, possibly in through the third before things calm down. Now at mid latitudes, it's not quite as good of a show. We are only expecting unsettled conditions pretty much all the way across the board, even though we are having that solar storm hit. NOAA is giving us about a 15% chance of a minor storm right around the first, but again, we could see a little bit of extended storming depending upon what kind of hits us after that. So aurora uh, photographers at mid-latitudes, well, it's going to be a bit more sporadic for you. You might catch something here and there, but only if you're dedicated should you chase. Switching to our solar flare and dayside radio blackout outlook over the coming week, we do have a few active regions in Earth view, and the forecast is being driven by region 3354, because it's the most active by far. In fact, solar flux is staying in the 160s, and even as that region rotates to the sun's far side, it, we still have the new regions that are going to rotate into view, so likely that solar flux is going to stay in where between the 150s and 160 range. This does mean that we do have moderate noise on the dayside radio bands. Again, region 3354 is very flare active. In fact, NOAA is giving us about a 40% chance of M-class flares. This is at an R1 to R2 level radio blackout over the next few days. Now, our X-class flare risk has dropped a little bit. Uh, we're only at about an R, uh, a 5% chance of an R3 radio blackout, and that's going to continue. That might even drop off a little bit more, even as region uh, 3354 rotates to the sun's far side. We just have to see what those new regions are going to do as they rotate into Earth view.
Now, switching to your radiation storm and polar aviation outlook over the coming week, everything is in the green. We don't have any active uh, radiation storms right now, but as region 3354 rotates to the sun's far side, this could change. In fact, we're sitting at the D1 normal range right now for aviators. This is also the S0 quiet range, but we do have about a 10% chance of a radiation storm, and this is because that region is rotating to the sun's west limb that always makes that radiation storm storm risk increase. So you aviators and uh, air crew and frequent flyers, be aware that we do have an elevated risk right now for radiation storms. So make sure you take those ICAO advisories into consideration in your flight plans. So the space weather this week is a bit of a mixed bag. We do have that glancing solar storm blow that should hit us about midday on the 1st, and that could be followed by a small pocket of fast solar wind, which could be followed by some more glancing blows. So aurora photographers at high latitudes, you could get a show, you know, right around midday of the 1st, in through about the 3rd before things calm down. But aurora photographers at mid-latitudes, well, you know, these storms really aren't all that strong, and now you're fighting a full moon as well, so aurora shows could be a bit tough to catch. Now, amateur radio operators, well, you're dealing mainly with region 3354 right now, but we're only sitting at about R1 level radio blackouts. We could get an R2 level radio blackout, but luckily R3 level radio blackout risk has gone down quite a bit. So you're dealing mainly with noise on the bands, and luckily those radio blackouts from those big flares are not lasting all that long. So things may be a bit tough on the day side for a few days more, but things might quiet down a little bit for you. So just hang in there. And now you GPS users, well, you know, we've got that kind of those radio blackouts on Earth's day side, and now we've got some solar storming on the night side. So things could be a little bit dicey all the way around. So be sure to stay away from dawn and dusk and stay away from aurora on Earth's night side for your GPS reception to stay top notch. I'm Tamitha Scove, the Space Weather Woman. Thank you for watching.